Mark, the Dark Knight Rises. So the first thing to say is that I'm very, very aware of the fact that people don't want spoilers and I'm going to do my best not to give them spoilers and that's fine. I do, however, want to talk about the film itself. The thing that I was most profoundly struck by whilst watching Dark Knight was that I am old enough to remember the fuss when Tim Burton's Batman was coming up. And the whole story was Tim Burton is going to take and reinvent this character. It's going to, you know, his vision is going to be radical. It's going to go owe a debt to Frank Miller's Dark Knight. It's going to be an R-rated film because it's going to be so... And then, of course, the film came out and it did indeed over here inaugurate the 12 certificate. But it was, in the end... A pantomime, and I'm um, and I'm somebody who's often accused of going easy on Tim Burton because I like him, but I really remember that crushing disappointment. I was very good friends with a guy called Tim Polcat from the Polcats, and I remember being in Mill Hill, waiting for that film to arrive and being so excited, and then going to see it and going, yeah. Mm. And what I felt watching The Dark Knight Rises was this is what we waited for. This is what Tim Polcat and I sat around in his house imagining that the Tim Burton vision was going to be the dark, brooding, full-on, grown-up version that we didn't get back then. So the first thing to say is that it really felt for me like at the end of the film, I heaved a sigh of relief. The sigh of relief being, <sighs> OK, that's it. We, you know, we got the thing. We've been, and believe me, I feel like I've been holding my breath for that for a very long time. The second thing, we've discussed this to some extent, great to see somebody demonstrating the cinematic quality of 2D film. Now, I saw the film in 35mm at the Empire. I haven't seen it in IMAX, and I'm going to see it in IMAX because Nolan is such a fan of the format, and I feel that until I've seen it in IMAX, I haven't fully seen it, but I wanted to see it in, on film, and that I think that's you know it, it was really important. I did. I mean, the blacks were as black as the blacks in uh, in Seven. You know, when David Finch was talking about the, the total blackout of the outside of the screen in Seven, the silver retained print that he used, I felt like watching that film, for me, the 35mm looked absolutely beautiful. So I do want to go and see it in IMAX, but also the balancing of the physicality of the actual physical effects against, obviously he uses CGI, but the physicality is right at the heart of it. Whenever there is an effect, there is a physical thing at the heart of the effect. So I love the way it looked. I love the fact that it's a cinematic 2D proper big, lovely, for me, 35mm, for other people, IMAX frame. And I love the fact that Wally Pfister is the star of the film and I and that he is a living embodiment of the trickle-up theory. And David Putnam, I once asked, you know, how would you reinvigorate the British film industry? He said, I'd get everybody who wants to make a film to make a low-budget horror movie, to start out doing that, make your money back, learn your lessons, and then go on from there. And that's what Pfister has done. And you look at the screen, you think, I'm sorry, it's that's an artwork in itself. So all those things, as far as it's the way it looks just blew me away and I did feel like it was a completion of something. As far as the storytelling is concerned, all the best superhero stories involve the anxiety that exists between the between one character, you know, the main character, and then and then their their alter ego, and also the weight of the alter ego. I mean, you look at, for example, the uh, Raimi Spider Man movie, drawing on Spider Man no more. But generally, they get over that stuff really quickly. In the case of Dark Knight, I was very impressed by how long it takes Bruce Wayne to get back in the saddle as Batman. I don't want to give anything else away as far as the plot's concerned, but obviously at the end of, uh, of Dark Knight, there is the whole thing about Batman is outcast, Batman is blamed. And it would have been very easy to just go in the first five minutes, oh, Gotham needs me again, I'm going to put the thing back and get back into the saddle. You do get a sense in the first movement of that film that that is a genuine absence, a genuine tragedy. He's not going to get back. You feel the weight of the suit in the same way that you feel the weight of the CGI effect. You feel the weight of the suit. One of the most moving moments is a speech in which Alfred is talking to him about hoping he wouldn't come back, hoping he wouldn't come back. And that, for that to be so moving tells you something about the weight of everything that's happened up until that moment. Incidentally, I should say that I think the film does owe, in its use of memory and dream, a debt to Inception, which I yeah. think, still think is the most extraordinary work. And um, whatever you may have read about spoilers and all the rest of it, all I will say is that at the very end of the film, the way you interpret the end of the film, very much like Inception, is what you bring to it is what you get from it. It's one of those films which very cleverly has unspoilerized itself because I've read versions of the end of that film and I think that it is very much open to interpretation. I think that film ends in the way you believe it ends and I think that that's a key to Chris Nolan's stuff is that he allows the audience to make those decisions, to make those journeys for themselves, even in the middle of a great big, you know, spectacular. 
The downsides is there is less black humour than there was in in Dark Knight. I mean, it's it's jet black now. It is really it's kind of Friedkin was saying that, that Killer Joe isn't a black comedy; it's a black hole comedy, and there is real proper darkness here. I mean, the Joker obviously was a comedic character, you know, a homicidal comedic, but comedic nonetheless. In the case of, of Bane, you don't have that. What you have is a much darker thing about. I'm working on something that's good for the ecology, you know, the, the power system that's going to be beautiful and free, but actually it may be the seeds of destruction. The whole idea that runs all the way through it, which is that all Batman's nemesis are in fact versions of himself. They all come from the same place. In this movie, they quite literally come from the same place. And it does as full on as I've ever seen in a comic book movie, that Nietzschean thing about you look long into the abyss, the abyss looks back into you, the two sides of, of, of the coin are both sides of the same thing, that which does not kill me strengthens me, but there is a sort of black hole in the character. The idea that the Dark Knight is actually inhabiting the world, or somehow he appears to be bringing all the bad stuff into existence with him. The other thing is, some people have complained about Bane's dialogue being hard to understand, and some people have said this is to do with which theatre you saw it in. I have many reports from Twitter from many different things saying that, that, that it is quite hard to understand some of his dialogue. I don't think it's anything to do with any theatre. Apparently in IMAX, you know, people have had less problems, but I, I think in the end it comes down to the fact if you can't see someone's mouth... It, it makes is, it more difficult for you to interpret what they're saying. Exactly. Yeah. You don't realise how much you do rely yeah. on lips. But actually, for me, it was just a matter of tuning my ear. I saw it at the Empire, which I think is one of the best uh, screening auditoriums in the country, and I didn't have a problem with it. I mean, it's, you know, I genuinely didn't, but you do have to tune your ear for it. And that is definitely true. There was also... I had some anxiety about the idea that, that in the end... In the end it's always difficult to reconcile the conflicts between the, between superheroes. We do get, for example, in this, some fist fights that take places within crowds. And I was thinking at the time, strange thing to do, but actually there seems to be an active move all the way through it to bring Batman down to ground level. And actually, although whilst I was watching certain action sequences, I thought it's a strange decision to have done it there. If Tim Burton had done this, this, this conversation, this fight would have taken place on the top of a roof or, you know, on some gothic structure. Mm -hmm. Why is it happening in the middle of a crowd? Actually, I think there is a point to it. The point is that in the end, it becomes part of that crowd mentality. Interestingly enough, if multiplex audiences, if crowds have essentially funded this movie, which they have because the success of Nolan's other movies have meant that he's been allowed to spend this much money to make a movie this daring, that actually says something rather positive about, you know, crowd mentality. The fact of the matter is people have told us for ages that multiplex audiences are dumb. No, they're not. They're clearly not. If they've funded this, which they have done, and I think this movie is going to make its money back, it's yet more proof that you do not have to be dumb to spend this much money. And just because there's more people in a multiplex doesn't mean they're thicker than the small number of people in the art houses. If Chris Nolan can make a movie that takes this much time, and it does take its time, it really does. At one point I was thinking... I can't believe you've been given the length of time to do... You know, wh where's the producer standing over you with a stick saying, I want him in the costume, <laughs> in the back, jumping yeah. off the thing, doing that now. You've been 20 minutes with a bloke not doing all that stuff. And I think that's really, really brave. And when the spectacle arrives, it's proper spectacle. It's proper Blimey, Charlie, you know, you do feel it's physical. You do feel that when the gimmicks are out, when the, you know, the gadgets are out, they're good gadgets, they do the stuff. And so I came out of it thinking, of, as I came out of the, of the cinema, I bumped into Mark Lawson, who hadn't enjoyed it. Okay. And, um, and he said something on the lines of, you know, well, the end was great, but what was all the stuff before? And my feeling was the end was great because, because of, of all the yes. stuff before. I have now I have tried as much as is possible mm. in that to not give away any sort of plot points. Zoe, can you can I firstly congratulate you on that you gave away nothing there and yet and, and I can I also say to witness you in full flow was quite a special moment for well, thank you very much. Uh, okay. And now um, but you, I, you loved it, right? I absolutely loved it. I have to say I was physically shaking for about three hours afterwards. Um, and I just sat there on, the, on the internet reading everything I could possibly read about it. I, you know, I gasped, I cried. 
um, I laughed and I was holding a book because uh, I went to see it on my own at the IMAX and I do say do I mean I love the fact that you went to see it on film first because you wanted to see it on film first um, well IMAX um, is film yeah on oh, film sorry. but on the on the, on the, the, on the, yeah. on the screen the Empire um, but I saw it on the IMAX and do go and see it at the IMAX if you can get to an IMAX please do because the, the experience is it's just in every corner I wanted to turn and look at the audience for their reactions at certain points yeah. but I could not take my eyes off the screen and I was holding a book because I'd gone on my own I was holding a book and when I came out I realised that there were scratch marks, nail marks in the book where I had gripped the book with glee, in fear, in and just and I think when I reached the end, I again it was that huge relief that it it, it was it so good it and it had down. done everything that you could want it to do. I'm I'm surprised that Mark Lawson didn't you know didn't enjoy it. And there's some great cameos. There are some wonderful treats in there. Um, and I won't say any more, you know, whether it be people or, or, or gimmicks or things that happen that you when I properly squealed with delight at some of the things that I got to witness. Oh, it's just a, I thought it was a joy. Remarkable. I think I that it, it also it is important, again, as you know, to, to kind of, as an industrial point, the industrial point being, look, we talked about, you know, raising the bar. You talked about multiplex audiences thinking they were through. And incidentally, I do, I genuinely, I'll repeat this. I think the film allows you to make your own mind up about certain key decisions. I think if if re reviewers have revealed uh, twists and then, then shame on them, frankly, because... Yes. You know, well, you just, you ruin it, it, the experience for everybody else. I think it's unfair. But it is possible to say you may well watch Dark Knight Rises and think, even as you're watching it, Good, this is long. This has languors. This has, you know, this has moments when, when there appear to be three different bits of plot going on and you're struggling to keep up with them. You know what? I don't mind that. I don't mind watching a film which you go, hang on, who is he? And he's connected to... And all the stuff with the Wayne boardroom. I mean, some, uh, some critics have said, it's going to completely lose when they're talking about stocks and shares. and no. Evident. I mean, the same thing was true of Inception. When Inception was made, everyone said, "Brilliant! Too smart to too smart to succeed." The, the the idea was that Warner's had allowed Chris Nolan to make Inception as a thank you present for making them so much money for Dark Knight. Can I just say, no studio has ever done that. The only example I can think of of that being the case is that Woody Allen was allowed by United Artists to make one of his films. Um, uh, it may have been Interiors. I remember reading this in the Stephen Buck thing, in which he said it was the only case he could think of of a studio allowing a director to make a movie because they thought it would be good for the director as opposed to good for anyone else. In the case of Christopher Nolan, it's baloney. Uh, it, at the centre of his filmmaking, whether you like Dark Knight Rises or not, and it will divide opinion, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not, it's a film made by someone who thinks you're as smart as he is. And that is to be championed. It's also a film made by somebody who loves cinema. You know, he does. He evidently loves cinema and he loves the way that cinema deals with memory and dreams and time and space and spectacle and story and narrative all at the same time and all without making you feel that it's doing all that. Can you see it? So I was talking to somebody today who's yeah. not seen the previous two. Can you see it as a piece of cinema on its own? Without seeing the first two, you know what? You, you should. Okay, you know what I'd say, and this two. is my one caveat. Yeah. Of course you can, but why would why you? Why would you? Okay. And I'll, I like again end on a, a footnote. For me, Batman Begins is still my favourite of the trilogy. I don't think that means it's the best, but it's my favourite. And the reason it's my favourite is I remember sitting in the in the uh, in the cinema watching Batman Begins, going, "Someone's made an art movie for this much money." Some, they've they've allowed him to do this, and I, that's it. I came out of this and I said to Nigel Floyd, "That is astonishing. It's like how did he get that past them?" And in a way, we've kind of got used to the idea that that's what Nolan does now. Don't forget what a miracle that is. You know, whatever reservations anyone may have about Dark Knight Rises, don't forget what a miracle it is that somebody who's intelligent and thinks you're intelligent just took a couple of hundred million dollars of the studio money, which incidentally he's going to pay them back quite everything yeah. in space. Huge amounts. You know.